Okay, first off, if everyone's viewing that, and let's say they are the number three team in the country, let's say they finish off their SoCon schedule, which really it's only Chattanooga that's going to probably cause them troubles. Is that that much of a drop off from one to two? Or... Welcome to the official podcast of FCS Fans Nation with your hosts, Kyler Neal, Matthew Frazee, and Jamie Williams. FCS Fans Nation. Boy, oh boy, I am excited about this one. We've got some pride to brag about here. Welcome to the FCS Fans Nation podcast. They say with kids or with puppies or with some things in life, the nights are long, the years are short. Well, talking about this season going by quickly, we are four weeks away from selection sunday for the playoffs if you're listening to that and hearing it for the first time whether you're on youtube or through your airways on your drive to work that is mind blowing and we're hoping to provide you guys the best fcs podcast for these next four weeks as the chaos continues matt frazy the og crew jamie williams kyler neal and uh whoa well i wasn't anticipating fireworks here tonight but this is just my natural hand pose Kyler, the fireworks seem to be on your end, my man, because you have a brand new setup. I know everyone's watching on YouTube, and they're just loving seeing uh, seeing your new background tonight. Oh, it's just chaos. It's not as nice as last year's, but um, this is just temporary. I finally got a new desk, so I decided I might as well put some stuff out and take them out of a box. But, you know, only anticipate seeing this for another three months until we move again. So, yeah, it is what it is. It looks good, my man. I like the bottle. I like that the Sam Adams lager is a nice touch. It's not an actual tap, right? You don't have a tap down there? Oh, it's a 100% a tap. No, I meant like if, oh, no, my, could you pour my it? My kegerator where I've been doing the other episodes, that's over in the other corner. Oh, so okay. uh, I'm a, I'm a, I got a desk now. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. Oh, just an adult up. up here. I'm a grown cool. up. Well, if uh, you're watching on YouTube, you saw fireworks behind me. Uh, my computer just updated to the new iOS. And apparently, if you do thumbs up, thumbs downs, things pop up in the background. So if that just happens throughout the episode, I don't know all the hand signals at this time. One hand signal I do know is that 2 plus 5 is 7. But I don't know where I was going with that. That's how many wins we have. That's how many wins. Yeah, that's how many wins. And 25 is our ranking in the FBS. There you go. Oh, what a recovery. Just like uh, what a leap up to the FBS for Jamie. Before we get the Big 7 kicked off, you got to be feeling good, man. I mean, we're rocking James Madison hats for you, even though it's an FCS podcast. Dude, how you feeling, Jamie? You're having a good week, right? I'm having a good week for JMU. That, that's <laughs> definitely for sure. So uh, modest. Right? Yeah. Uh, pretty excited about the way that they've been playing this year. I mean, I expected another really good season. Not sure I expected 7-0, and kind of did, but, you know, I'm trying to be modest. But we got a couple of tough games down the road, and uh, we'll see. I mean, it, I think we're anywhere from a 10-2 and to a 12-0 and team, and we'll see. I'll hope for 12-0. and I think uh, it's been fun to watch the transition for sure. I don't know if it's as fun as watching this FCS football season, so let's get right yeah. into it, into the Big 7. Uh, first, a great word from our amazing sponsors. The FCS Fans Nation podcast is brought to you by Walk On Apparel. Walk On Apparel specializes in FCS and mid-major clothing and believes that every fan base should have quality options to rep the schools they love. Along with you receiving a great product, 10% of the profit from every sale is donated directly to that school's athletic fund. Visit walkon-apparel.com and use promo code FCSFANSNATION to get 15% off of your purchase. Limited schools currently available with new releases monthly. Walk on apparel. Up the fans, up the culture. The FCS Fans Nation podcast is also sponsored by the ultimate analytical prediction football experience. Introducing the Versus Sports Simulator, your secret weapon for predicting FCS, mid-major, and all other football games. Get ahead of the game and take your sports betting and knowledge to the next level with a site and app that's built to ignore bias and just give you the facts. If you subscribe today and use promo code FCSFANSNATION, you'll save 20% on your subscription. You can download the Versus app on the App Store and Google Play 
by searching Versus Sports Simulator or going to VersusSportsSimulator.com. With Versus, it's not a prediction, it's science. The top seven FCS topics of the week. This is the Big Seven. Ye of little faith was Jamie and Kyler for my wonderful team. Way to go, Furman. Way to represent for me. And that's where we're going to start the Big Seven tonight, gentlemen. Uh, No preseason hype about this team. They are for real as Furman takes down Western Carolina in a great matchup down there in the SoCon. And uh, this is where we're going to begin with a great question from Mr. Jason Plotkin. Jason, I always love you coming into the show and dropping questions. We appreciate you a ton, my man. Uh, what did the loss to Furman tell us about Western Carolina? And I think this has to go to Jamie, uh, just because Western Carolina has been just the team you promoted before anybody else. And this doesn't mean that they're falling off a cliff by any means. Still a hell of a game, close matchup. What do you think, Jamie? What does this tell us about Western Carolina? Uh, it tells us that uh, Furman's better than Western Carolina uh, overall. Uh, Desmond Reed didn't play a whole lot in this game. Uh, I think if he had played, I mean, maybe we still have a summer result and Furman still wins. I know he got in there a, a little bit uh, coming off that uh, soft tissue injury, had the bye week to kind of get get better, but um, kind of more of a one-dimensional uh, Western Carolina offense, less of the run game. Uh, so they kind of can key on Cole Gonzalez. He went 21 for 35 there, which was at 60%, something like that. Um, not his normal game, but who did have a normal game was Tyler Huff and Dominic Rorito. And that's what Furman has been just relying on with a solid defense. So basically we saw exactly from Furman what we've been seeing all year. And that's a top five team in the country right now. I don't know how that's going to translate to the playoffs, uh, but Western Carolina still held their own. They're still five and two. Um, they definitely have to win against Mercer this week and then kind of just finish off their schedule against a couple of the weaker teams. But that's a playoff team. It, it it didn't. I don't think it told us anything negative about Western Carolina other than they lost a football game. And Kyler, what does this tell you about Western Carolina and really Furman right now? Are you are you really shocked by any of this, or is this just kind of exactly what you saw? Even though you guys predicted a Western Carolina win, you know, one of us picked Furman. That's okay. Uh, what are you feeling F-U, about these teams? F you all day. Um, so twenty nine is probably about what I thought Furman would end up scoring. I thought this was going to be more of a shootout. Um, Furman's defense came to play again, Desmond Reed, one of the top running backs in all the nation. He only got two carries, right? He did not play, which was a bummer. Cause when you have the two best teams in a conference, you're hoping you got all your best players to see really what can happen. But like Jamie said, maybe even if he plays Furman's defense was just lights out. They were able to stop the run completely. Tyler Huff played a phenomenal game. I mean, it wasn't just the passing department. He was a good game manager, but he was running. I think he ran for a first down pretty much every single time he had the ball. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the run the run game from Furman, just Western Carolina had no answer for. It was it was really impressive. The defense was impressive. Getting out to that 13-0 lead, that definitely helps. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I would love to see this actual – and I don't like same uh, teams when they rematch in the playoffs. I would actually love to see Desmond Reed – Western Carolina as a rematch early in the playoffs, if they can maybe get there in the second round or something like that, or the um, quarters, maybe Um, it would be pretty fun to see them in the quarters because then, you know, one of them from the SoCon is going to the semifinals for the first time since I started growing hair on my chest. So that's pretty exciting, but yeah, no. um, Yeah. It's just a really, really fun battle. And you got to give props to Furman. You were praising Furman the last 150 years, Matt. And you finally got it. You finally mm. got it. Feels so, so good. Um, purple teams unite. No, it, it was a fantastic team. This doesn't really sh- move down Western Carolina that much in my books. I had them as a what? The number four or five team in the nation. I'll probably drop them just a little bit, but it's not a drastic. I see some people, and I don't know where some people were ranking them prior to this, but some people are dropping them like 15, 16. I'm like, dude, they just probably played a top four team in the nation. I mean, I had Furman in my top five as well. So they just played a top five team without probably their best player and one of the best players in all the FCS, and they still were in a battle. So you got to give props to both teams here. But yeah, they're they're this was they're fun teams to watch. Yeah, f you all day for Furman. I love that team. Love that squad. The thing is, I'm gonna I'm gonna almost insult them 
but then back them in the same sentence here, okay? First off, they're about to be the number three team in the country, in my opinion, at least with the stats poll. They'll, they'll replace Sac State. Why is this team, Furman, in the SoCon, viewed so much like, oh, yeah, they'll probably be in the quarterfinals? Okay, first off, if everyone's viewing that, and let's say they are the number three team in the country, let's say they finish off their SoCon schedule, which really it's only Chattanooga that's going to probably cause them troubles. Is that that much of a drop off from one to two? Or who, less about one and two, take it at this angle. Who behind Furman or around them are you convinced that, like, well, Furman may be quarterfinals? There must be teams that are ranked six or eighth or 12th that maybe you think are better than Furman, which I don't understand. Then why rank them number three? Combined with that, here's something about Furman 62nd total defense. 33rd total offense, 18th rushing offense, 71st passing offense. It's not that impressive statistically, but they just win football games in kind of these old school ways. But overall, compared to the rest of the F statistically, it does not jump off paper as some monster. So I guess back to you, Kyler, what, what is it about Furman that doesn't give you as much confidence? Is it just those stats I said to you or what? It's stats. It's watching them play. So, I mean, they deserve to be in the top four because of resume. This is a good win. Um, they're undefeated versus the FCS. They deserve to be in the top four, no matter how you look at it. If you want to put South Dakota above them, I'm cool with that. Other than that, they deserve to be in the top four. But there's a little bit of recency bias with the SOCON. I mean, you can say it doesn't happen. I don't like to do it with my rankings because – if you're deserving to be there, I'm going to put you in there. Even if I think you're not going to beat some of the teams behind you. I, I don't view a top 25 as this is just who I think the best teams are no matter what. I think it's kind of what you earn to get in that top 25, and it is a little bit of resume base. So right now, they're the top four team in the nation in my poll. But, yeah, do I think they're going to beat other mini seeded teams? Probably not, unless Incarnate Word's in there, right? If Incarnate Word wins out, they're firm, and I'm, I'm going to bet the house on them. Other than that, it's just, yeah, I, recency bias with the SoCon. Nothing that they have done has impressed me when they go and play teams outside the SoCon from a top-tier conference. That's that's kind of what it is. Um, yeah, their they're out-of-conference schedule wasn't that impressive. It is what it is. I mean, <laughs> I, just, I mean that's I all it is. It's really just a bias. You got to be proven wrong. I think wrong. they're going to go to the semifinals, and I just don't think they will. It's just one of those things like you look at it, let's say they're the three, let's call it the three or the four seed. Are you going to take them against Delaware? Are you going to take them against Montana? Are you going to take them against Idaho? Are you going to take them for against North North yeah. I, I don't right see why not. I don't see why not. I don't see how any of those teams are better than Furman. Like just, I, I've, I've watched, I've watched quite a bit of these teams. I've seen the clips. I try to do the catch up on them and I don't get how Idaho is going to go to Furman if Furman's the home team. And they're gonna go win that game. And they very these, well might not. You know, these other teams give me plenty t reasons of to doubt them. I have plenty of reasons to doubt all these other teams as well. So maybe this is just part of the chaos, which we're gonna talk about here in the Big Seven, where it's making it a lot of fun. I, yeah. I just, yeah, I don't know. I'm just if not. If they convinced. win out, they're getting a top three seed worst case scenario. Right. I mean that that's how it's gonna be. So no matter what, if they win out, you are going to Furman. Some teams gonna have to go to Furman and prove themselves. Let's True. say it's NDSU because NDSU doesn't look like they're going to get a seed. Let's say they go to Furman in the quarterfinals. Yep. I'm pretty sure even how NDSU has been rough, they would be the favorite. I I'm, I would I would bet that they would be the favorite. Yeah, that would feel a little bit like the spring going to Sam Houston where I picked Sam Houston to win that game. I don't know. Yeah, we'll but see. the lines were a little bit different. Yeah, we'd have to see what Vegas's line is on that game. Could be interesting. No, I meant Sam Houston's line in that Oh, yeah, yeah, A little yeah, yeah. different. Than what yep. Furman has. A little different beast. Well, uh, some lines that are fun to watch is anything in the Missouri Valley. And that gives us on to question number two of the Big Seven. You and I and UND. Boy, we had a lot of questions about UND from Brandon Anderson, Mr. Jeremiah Rash, Peter Bogarty. Appreciate all three of you. In a bunch of different ways, you guys basically asked, what the hell happened to UND? Um, is you and I just getting better? Or did you and I hit UND hit the bison hangover, as it's been called in the past? Um, what do you think there, Jamie Williams? Did I mean this was kind of a shocker? It's not shocking that you and I 
beat somebody bad in the UNI Dome. Like, that's not shocking. We've seen it before. But boy, UND just got eviscerated. They didn't even put up a single point. How did you react to that, especially as a voter? I mean, I was definitely shocked. I picked UND to win this game. But at the same time, does this not happen every year where somebody goes into the Uni Dome and just drops drops a game and looks like this and Northern Iowa looks like that? And people are like, oh, it's time to rank Northern Iowa. And then they lose the next three games. Northern Iowa finds a game. And they found it against North Dakota. Uh, they just the way the matchup worked for them. Their their defense shut down that run game, and Schuster didn't do much better. It's just one of those games. Um, let's see. I think I had UND. I threw them all the way up to seven. Uh, uh, maybe it, the good thing is kind of to bring them back to earth to where they really should be. Uh, I, I know I've kind of overreacted on some games this year. Uh, and with my rankings up and down, but uh, I think that might be one where I, I'll push them a little too high and I'll just bring them back down to earth where they belong. Um, they definitely, it's not like I'm going to throw you and I in there and put UND behind them. It, we're at the resume part of the season where we're ranking based off of resumes and not just a head to head as a uh, Kyler just got so mad that he knocked his uh, microphone and all that off the desk. Uh, I guess he was just really upset about UND's loss. And, it, you know, like I said, it's just – it's to the point of the season where things happen. It's the Missouri Valley Football Conference, which is a good conference, and it's the kind of thing that, that's going to happen unless you're South Dakota State. I mean, I don't know, Matt. You are you hate UND as much as pretty much anybody else in the world. So how did you react to that game? That is true. Um, boy, I try not to just sit there and be like, well, they played their Super Bowl, but boy, it was hard. UND looked so lifeless. It was disgusting. And you and I looked like they were playing inspired inspired football. I mean, it looked like UND had come out of a 12-round a nine a 12 round fight in a boxing ring and had given it all their all and showed up with nothing. So to me, my reaction is that I've just been saying Northern Iowa is going to suck this year. They're not going to be good. I'm not going to overreact and say that you and I is some awesome team. But in terms of them winning that game, they now have a chance. If Northern Iowa had dropped this one, this was really Northern Iowa's first playoff game. Because if they had dropped this one, their season's done. You know, then they're sitting three and four. Um, they drop one more, game over. But let's just look at their schedule. I've got it pulled up here on YouTube. They're going to play at Illinois State. Huge game this weekend. They'll kill Western Illinois. They'll beat Missouri State. So what happens between Illinois State and that North Dakota State game that they host at the end? could determine about you and I actually getting into the playoffs, which in the beginning, like I said, I could end up on a lot of hype videos for saying how bad and crappy I think you and I was going to be this year. And maybe that's still going to be true. Uh, we'll have to see as Kyler Neal famously says. So I don't want to, I almost Jamie don't want to overreact to both of these situations. Like UND came off their biggest win in program FCS history easily. And they had a huge letdown game. And I'm not. I'm still not sold that you and I is some sort of world beater in a playoff team. So, Kyler, uh, you you were cut. You're recovering as best as you and I did uh, from the downfall. What what do you think about these two squads, man? How are you feeling about what could be just seven win Missouri Valley across the board? The you and I that we've seen since probably you know 2014, 2015. Again, like they didn't look good against Weber State, who's now looking like a pretty bad football team. Um, then they've looked. Great against North Dakota, which was insane. But just the week prior, they looked like dog crap against South Dakota State, right? <laughs> South Dakota State is beating a lot of people, but not like how they beat you and I. So I don't know if we're just going to say, hey, they're getting better. Um, it's probably a little mix of you and I is who you and I is at home. They're a really tough team on the road. They can be physical. Styles make for matchups. Maybe it is a little bit of the bison hangover, though. I will say that, like you just said, Matt, they're getting off probably their biggest win in program history since they've been a Division One program, right? Beating your rivals, beating the dynasty of NDSU and the way that they beat them. Yeah, you're, you're going to act like you're on the top of the world and nothing bad could happen to you. Then you get this Northern Iowa team whose backs are against the ropes, right? After they just got demolished by South Dakota State and they needed to prove a game. And yeah, you, you just ended up kicking North Dakota in the face. Um, pretty interesting game to see. I did, I did not expect that. But it is you and I. This is just the Northern Iowa team that we have seen. They can play really good. They can play really bad. They can play mediocre. Um, just every week is a different 
week with your, uh, Northern Iowa. I don't know what football team is going to come out on the field. I don't know if they're going to be world beaters. I don't know if they're going to be soft, right? I mean, this was even the, the Northern Iowa in the playoffs when we out physical them and Eastern wasn't physical that year. So I just never know what to expect with the Northern Iowa. If you're betting on this team, stop betting on them. You, you never know what's going to happen with this Northern Iowa team, but they are talented. They got good home field advantage. They are in a good conference, and they are a blue blood and a historically good team. They get their recruits. They get the talent, and they are just they're just Northern Iowa. I don't even know what to say. They're, they're good sometimes. They're not good other times. This is just a very normal thing that we're going to see them do. Yeah, Northern Iowa is weird, and – what else is weird is as we move away from this question, uh, it's pulled up here on YouTube, the Missouri Valley conference records. Um, of course, this is conference ranking. That's why it's going to go uh, all over the place here a little bit. But starting at South Dakota State down, 7-0, and 6-1 South Dakota, 4-3 and Northern Iowa, 4-3 and Youngstown, 4-3 and UND, 5-2 and NDSU, 5-2 and Southern Illinois, 4-3 and Illinois State. The, the the possibilities for seven win teams throughout this conference is insane. And uh, we'll have another question here to to kind of go off of that. But it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the Valley moving forward. Almost as interesting would be, oh boy, those Montana State Bobcats, the t-shirts that Kyler and I are rocking tonight. Uh, holy crap. They played Sacramento State and one of the best, most athletic FCS players <laughs> we've seen all season as we saw them hurdle over the Hornets. And that is our background tonight on YouTube. And Mr. Everly Richards wants to know how many Red Bulls would you have to drink to attempt a hurdle like the Bobcats running back Julius Davis uh, combined with let's talk about that Montana State victory over Sac State. And uh, Kyler, we'll start with you, man. It's the big sky. The Bobcats seem to just find a way and keep rolling. I saw some tweets about, hey, if you liked NDSU football back in the day uh, during the Craig Bowl kind of era, make sure you check out Montana State. What are you feeling about the Bobcats, man? We know they're number two, but is this just cementing things that they're on a different level? Um, no, this is just showing that they are the number two team in the nation. Um, I don't think Sac State deserved anyone's top five, and yet they had them. I think I had Sac State at like 12 in my poll, something around there. I could be wrong. I don't think I had them in my top 10. So, um, I get it when Idaho lost, you just Slot vote and you move them up, and you move everyone else down. But I think they were leaning too hard on this Stanford win when Stanford is just not a good program. And and they got up for that game because it was Troy Taylor. It is what it is. But I mean, outside of the score, this is a very competitive back and forth driving game. I mean, Sac State played tough. I just don't think they, they got the juice to, you know, go toe to toe with the number two team in the nation. And Montana State by far is the number two team in the nation. And anyone who has them not top two, pretty ridiculous, pretty crazy. They're by far the number two team in the nation. It's a fun game. I mean, you got to see a little bit of throwing. Malat came in. Chambers, you know, um, he looked a little iffy, but he didn't get to play that much. Um, but, I mean, this is just a Montana State team that every single year they're doing the same stuff, but they keep improving on the offensive side. And this Sac State team is a little scrappy. They were able to pick off that quarterback, Bennett, a few times, and I think that was the big difference maker. Maybe if you don't have some of those turnovers, maybe it is at that last possession, Sac State could potentially take the lead or something like that. But, I mean, um, they're two tough teams. Definitely a number two team in the nation. Definitely a top 15 team in the nation. And I, I don't think this does anything else <laughs> outside of it was, it was a fun game, fun back and forth type of game. They're very similar but different styles of offenses. Right. They got a mobile quarterback who's looking to to run and throw a little bit. Uh, Montana State definitely is a little bit more powerful on the ground. But I mean, they're a weird, fun, dynamic option style team, RPO style team. Um, but yeah, I mean, Montana State looks like they're coming for South Dakota State and they want them again. And these, these big sky late at night games, they're fun. Most people are asleep, especially if you're on the East Coast. But I mean, they're fun and they've been some solid solid battles every time they do these night games i mean i don't know if there's been a blowout they've all been these back and forth type of games and, and this was still a back and forth game until really the fourth quarter and, and then kind of montana state started finally pulling away a little bit to where they were comfortable with the win but yeah i want to see chambers more than i want to see him a lot i will say that i still think they should give chambers 
more opportunities than Malat, but I know Malat is the hero of, of, of Montana, so they're going to keep riding with him as long as he's healthy, and it's not bad to have Chambers and Malat in the backfield running that type of offense. I mean, they're similar in a sense, um, but it, it was fun seeing Davis run all over Sac State. It was fun seeing um, you know Bennett, the quarterback, he had a couple bad picks, but some of those trick plays that Sac State was drawing up, I don't know if you saw some of those reverses. They were fun. I mean, I I, I wasn't following the right guy. Um, that hurdle was insane. If you're asking about the Red Bulls, no, I'm, I'm not attempting that. That was beautiful. That was like a picturesque hurdle. I do that in Madden all the time, and it, I make it look pretty. But in real life, that was flawless. What what top 10 were they? Did you see where they landed in the top 10 for ESPN? It was, I didn't catch it, no, but I saw that uh, they were posted all over on the fans page, of course. I think they made the top 10 for had to know, make top, the top 10, 10. plays. Yep. I want to know. I want to know. It had to be top three. It looked, it was sexy because it wasn't just a hurdle and then he gets hit two feet after. I mean, he, he was still running. He didn't lose any speed. It was impressive. almost got there. He almost, almost got, got there. there. It was impressive. It was a sexy hurdle. It was impressive. And Montana State has looked really impressive. Just, they just keep. Who's beating them the rest rolling. of the schedule? Well, that's the question. You got Idaho next week is going to be the the big one, and then you know Montana, the Grizz at home. You never know what could happen. Jamie, These last five weeks are way tougher than the first portion of the season outside of South Dakota State, for sure. And I'm glad you mentioned South Dakota State because since we're talking about these Bobcats and Sac State, Sac State is who we thought they were. I mean, Good South team. Dakota State was not a world beater against SIU, and that's not an easy game. That's nothing to discredit SIU. They're a good squad. But, Jamie, even with the head-to-head -head result, are you feeling like if they made in Frisco, it could possibly go either way? I'm still all on SDSU. How is Montana State starting to make you feel any different at all? Uh, not really. I still think we would be looking at a pretty good game. I know Kyler thinks that – South Dakota State would uh, win much easily, more easily than they did. And I could definitely see that. I, I do still worry about the one-dimensionality of Montana State. And I am going to keep my eyes very, very tightly on the brawl of the wild. Because Montana's run defense is phenomenal. So can they shut down this just behemoth three, four-headed monster of Montana State run and run game. I will be I am very interested to see that. I think overall big picture uh, I'll save that for another question. Never next the next question I think. Um, I'll talk big picture then. Um yeah, I, I think we're still looking at Montana State is still going to run through everybody. I'm definitely, you know, as excited I am to see how Montana's run defense does against Montana State. I'm still going to pick the Bobcats. And that's not don't worry, Montana fans. I'm not sliding your team. I'm still going to pick the Bobcats because right now they're the better team. It, uh, it's going to be fun to see it play out. And, yeah, they do not have – it could take one slip up here for opinions to change. I mean, that schedule is not easy as they finish out. Idaho and then going to Wagriz is going to be crazy. So, And uh, crazy chaos. I mean, it seems to be a theme. Chaos definitely seems to be the theme of the year. And – uh our good friend Scott, Wade Berger, Preston Adams, they all are asking about that chaos. How is chaos season going? Scott's personally loving it. And is the chaos slash parody across the top 25 and anomaly this year? Or is this a look at the future with the portal and NIL spreading talent across the league? I guess let's just talk about that. We talked about Montana State SDSU and then why not Furman? Why not this team? Why not that? What do you think is causing this, or do you just think that this is just a fun year? Jamie, what, what do you think, man? I mean, I do not know who I would pick to be the third and fourth semifinal team. I wouldn't bet nearly nothing on anybody besides Montana State and SDSU right now. Are you feeling the same way? or a little Yeah, different? pretty much, pretty much. And I think that's kind of where we are with this chaos is – a lot of everybody else is losing and then they'll lose like, Oh, they weren't as good as I thought they were. Oh, the team wasn't as good as I thought they were. And as it goes through the year and I continue to hear that when somebody loses now, it's one thing when it's like William and Mary and they're clearly not as good as we thought they were, but when it's UND and they beat the Bison and then they lose, Oh, I'm not, they're not as good as we thought they were. What we're seeing is outside of the top two teams, 
it is a toss up from three to about 12 and from 13 to 35. I think you can see that the top two teams being obviously South Dakota State, Montana State are so far out in front of everybody else. And before that was NDSU and JMU, and you can see that too, that everybody else is just pretty darn good or average and anything can happen based off how you play one day or another based off the matchups. You, If you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you know that the styles and the matchups matter. And that's why the transitive property doesn't work. It's like, oh, is, does that mean you and I is going to go beat NDSU by 30 points? No, not necessarily. But maybe. It is just instead of trying to put down everybody that loses every week, like I tend to see, oh, this this stinks. This team stinks. This team sucks. They knew they weren't good. Enjoy the football. Celebrate the winners. I mean, we got it on our first question. What does the loss tell us about Western Carolina? How about what does the win tell us about Furman? Been a little bit frustrated about that over the last little bit. Celebrate this. This, this is fun. This is what we've been wanting for years. And we still have the top two teams. That's probably what we're going to wind up with. But enjoy the closer matchups. Who wants to see the blowouts? I'd want to see this these games where it's coming down to the end. I want to see a ranked Austin P have to go to overtime at Southern Utah. I want to see Parker McKinney trying to beat SEMO on the last play. It's it's fun. Enjoy it. Quit bitching about the teams when they lose and that and saying oh, they all just suck. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Dang, I like that. I'm gonna give you two thumbs up for that sort of uh rant, my man. That was good. Nobody should be sitting here watching FCS football and just being sad about the losses. They should just be happy about everything that's going on around here. So um, if you're not watching on YouTube, you don't understand what just happened and you just missed out. So that stinks to be you. You should hit subscribe on your YouTube app. Um, but honestly, amongst all the chaos, Preston, Wade, Scott, something to point out really is that there are a lot of teams that people just aren't talking about as much. Like Delaware has got one loss. Like nobody's talking about Delaware. Um, when you look at it, like UT Martin is right where UT Martin's supposed to be. Florida A&M, right where they're supposed to be. You know, a team like Villanova is coming up and going up here. So the chaos really is who keeps dropping out of that top three, four, or five spot. Uh, but there's actually just a lot of teams that are on par and doing what they're supposed to do. I'm not sure if there is as much of an outlier besides the fact that NDSU is just not as good as they normally are. Uh, Kyler, you got uh, you got as much passion as Jamie on this one. I love that rant, by the way. That was beautiful. Yeah, just the opposite. Everyone sucks. Right, <laughs> that's the difference. Everyone is absolutely trash. Everyone trash is here. There's not there's not 25 top 25 teams this year. I'll just say that. Um, but I, I don't know. We get this we get this question every single year on this podcast. Holy crap! We haven't seen this much parity. Right? This there's this much chaos in the season. But then we get this ass every single year. This is what happens every single year. It's just. Like you guys said, you don't know who maybe the, the three and four team for the semifinals are going to be, where maybe in previous years you still probably didn't, or at least maybe you knew one other team, but everyone thought Sac State was going to be the fourth team, right? But then you also had Incarnate Word. You had like four other teams that we knew could easily make a run to the semis. It's not that big of a difference right now outside of maybe more of the name brand programs that we are used to seeing aren't as good. Maybe they still are. There's a little bit of fluctuation. I like seeing Holy Cross lose. That was a phenomenal, fun game. Lafayette, good for you. Um, but it, it's just more of the same. The only big difference that we are noticing is a little bit with the portal because a team can change who they are like drastically. It's not going to take them three years to develop to get that senior class, that high junior class where you're like, all right, this team, they're going to be good. Teams can get really good in one year, one offseason. And they can regress quite a bit in one offseason because maybe your top stud players are leaving. Um, so, I mean, some teams are absolutely eating it up and loving this portal. Some teams are hating it. Like North Dakota State's probably hating the portal right now. Um, they used to be really high on bringing in kids, especially from the South, that are like those talented kids to use in, in specific, like their wide receivers, running backs. They had a lot of X factors that they'd put on this program. Now some of them are leaving. And maybe they don't have the same type of players that what we saw in the last four or five years because 
guess what? The portal is a real thing. But then other programs are loving it because, all right, I lost a whole positions group due to my senior class. Instead of developing this great freshman class, which I'm still going to do, I'm going to plug in a couple people, redshirt them, so I can develop them the old-fashioned way, redshirt them, get them ready, without losing a full year of that, basically, positions group. So, I mean, if you're using the portal right, you can make some drastic changes, uh, but it will eat some teams alive as well. But other than that, like, I don't think this is an anomaly this year. I think we see this chaos all the time. And when you were just putting up the top 25, there wasn't a lot of teams on there that I don't think were not on my top preseason 25. It hasn't changed as much as maybe some people are thinking. It's just, yeah, there, there's some teams that you're not used to seeing lose that are losing but also they're getting some good wins too. And it's just a slightly different order, but the same 25, 35 teams that we all anticipated are about within that top 35 realm. Yeah, it is a, there's a lot of chaotic games. There's a lot of great games. Those big sky and night ones are whew, a ton of fun to watch, but you're right. It, it probably hasn't been as psychotic as maybe we thought, you know, <laughs> you had that thumb on your shoulder, dude, I you're literally, things are going well with the new iOS. It's just going great. Oh, man. What else is going great is this, if you're a great quarterback in the FCS. And Alex Kekel, a great SDSU fan, he wants to know who are the most clutch quarterbacks in the FCS right now. Wide open field uh, could be wide open field right now. It could be a difference maker. On that note, is Mark Gronowski underrated as such? Five and two, actually six and two, but didn't have to attempt to pass in one of the games when he is tied or trailing in the fourth quarter. Losses to UND in his second start, an Iowa team that finished ranked after coming off an ACL surgery. So lots of praise there for Alex, for Mark Kronowski. And boy, I'm going to try to prevent myself from going Jamie Williams on this one in terms of how right Alex is about, I would say, how undervalued Mark Kronowski is. This gentleman, who I've said for the last two, three years, who I would have loved to see in a Bison uniform, I know he would hate me to ever hear him hear me say that, this guy has Easton stick it factor. It just is there. He's the guy you want at the end of the game, fourth quarter. Uh, everybody in our podcast network in a big DM group we had going during the Montana State South Dakota State game will say will knows that I sent the message after Montana State scored. I think they went up four, and I was just like, I was like, well, there's like two minutes left, and they have Mark Gronowski, so SDSU is not going to lose this game, and voila. Guess what happened? Mark Gronowski took the team all the way down the field. Um, so he is surrounded by an amazing offensive line, the best roster in the FCS. But I truly think what could make a difference in all these playoff games when things get tight is who is at the helm. How has that not been true in just quarterback play in general? Sam Houston, South Dakota State in the spring final, you know, like Mark Gronowski goes down and it comes down to the last thing and Sam Houston has the better quarterback on the field, makes the play at the end, wins the game. The quarterback play is key. And who's the most clutch quarterback in the FCS right now? The best quarterback in the FCS, in my opinion, is Mark Gronowski. But uh, transitioning from my promotion from him, you guys are definitely, will, you can jump on that if you want to. I will pull up what uh, Mr. Chris Hammond created for us, and we debated about a little bit before we posted on Twitter. The top 10 FCS QBs this season from FCS Fans Nation. I will say, looking onto it in the Twitter comments, Davius Richard from North Central or North Carolina Central is probably our one miss on this list. Um, not having him on there is yeah, it's a pretty big black eye. Besides that, I think it's pretty solid. So, um, Jamie, you're going to be a voter. You're going to vote for people to win Coach of the Year, Offensive Player of the Year. How are you feeling about the QBs this season, and who's in the top tier? I mean, you definitely said it right about Gronowski. Ice in his veins. I I think we all agree with you when they have the ball with two minutes left and against Montana State and he's at the helm. They're going to make it happen, and it took three plays. Um, I'm going to give you a name that's on this list and a game that's not on this list just from this week. One loss was 1-1. One, one. Tyler Huff locked down that game with a 53-yard run. And – you know, usually when I'm voting, I'm looking more for a quarter. If I'm looking at a quarterback, I want to see your passing stats. Don't care about your rushing stats quite as much. We can talk about 2019 and why that vote went like it did all we want. Uh, but the other one is Matt Sluka. It, he single-handedly 
kept Holy Cross in that game and ran for 330 yards on 28 carries. It was obnoxious how he just would break away and nobody could stop him. But he's also been able to take that team down the field a couple of times when they needed to. And, you know, those are a couple of more names. Uh, Aiden Bowman, he's done it a couple of times. He's he's locked down games. So I think we've got a lot of them, but the top of the heap is definitely Mark Gronowski. I would want him on my team. Uh, he's a winner. He's a gamer. Uh, he just he just knows the play to make. It doesn't matter. Yeah, he's got the most talent, but you still have to make the plays, and he makes them every time. Yeah, when this senior class for SDSU goes on, um, he's going to be huge at Northwestern, where I think he's originally around from. Ha ha! Thumper and the SDSU guys just pulled. They pulled off the side of the road and screamed at their steering wheels. Uh, Kyler, some thoughts here on the quarterbacks, my man. Yeah, um, Mark Ranowski, solid. You guys, you guys say it all the time. I don't think he's the most clutch. He doesn't go in a lot of situations where he has to be that clutch. And honestly, the second half of, of this game, he, he wasn't that clutch at all. Um, he had a solid drive to get him into field goal range. He also almost lost the game the drive before because of that turnover. So, I mean, when you're just talking about clutch, eh, I'm going to give it to, and I, I do think Mark Gronowski, every, every praise he gets, I'm not saying he's not the best quarterback or he's the most NFL ready or anything like that, but, when it comes to pure clutch, we haven't seen him in many times where he needs to be clutch, and he almost gave this game away. Sure, he ended up getting it into field goal range, but again, the drive before, he almost gave it away for him. Now I will say Saluka because this, this performance, and again, they lost. Jamie just said it. They lost. They lost a lot yet. When he was not performing well because it was coming down hard rain and you know, his passing attack was completely shut down, what did he, he throw for like 30%? He was dog crap in the passing game. I see Matt's giving a thumbs up on accident because he's scratching his armpit, but thank you, Apple, for showing that thumbs up. Um, but instead, he decided to just put it on the ground. The weather's not where he wanted to be. He couldn't make the right throws. Wide receivers dropping balls. He couldn't. He wasn't very accurate. So he decided to just torch him on the ground. I mean, 330 yards rushing from a quarterback, it was literally him, like Jamie said. It was him versus Lafayette. I have never seen a game where it's Mark Gronowski versus the whole program because no one else on South Dakota State is performing well. They have such a good team. It is literally Saluka and no one else versus a whole team. And he he came back. I mean, to be a one-player team, it was like some of those Eric Berrier performances where you're like, if it wasn't for Eric Berrier, Eastern probably win two games that year. Saluka is that dude, and I gave him a lot of crap in the beginning of the year, but – he is that dude, and even in a loss, that was one of the most gutsy performances I've ever seen from a quarterback, just taking the game over, going, all right, it's one versus 11, try and stop me, and they couldn't. I mean, it was ridiculous. If there's fifth quarter, he's probably winning that game because you know they were coming back, but fun game. Matthew Saluka, hell of a performance, even though your arm was horrible this weekend. You ended up making up for it on the ground that I don't think any other quarterback in the FCS could do right now. Yeah, I would take either of those quarterbacks on my squad because they are absolute ballers. They are certainly good at what they do. And iOS definitely failed me there. I was supposed to oh, get what confetti. Was this supposed to do? I was supposed do to get this. confetti. There oh, go. there you go. That. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so dumb. Uh, We're turning Jamie... into like the Nickelodeon NFL Sunday game. Yeah, yeah. I, this is basically exactly what this is turning into right here. That's supposed to be balloons, I guess one, but I guess it's not picking it up. So, uh, Jamie, if there were balloons here, they'd be handed out to our top coaches of the season. Mr. Joshua Hoffman has a question here. Coach of the year candidates, he's curious. I'm going to give you the whole floor here uh, for this question because you will be voting on this. And who are you tracking as some of these top coaches and could be the possible award winner at the end of the season? Yeah, to me right now, I've got this boiled down to three names. And usually your coach of the year will go to somebody who has taken the team from where you didn't think they were going to be to a much higher uh, higher spot. So I've, I've got three or four names I think I'm going to uh, give you here. Um, first one, obviously, because I've been touting his team all year, Kerwin Bell, Western Carolina. I've seen the progression of that team from one win when he took over to a team that's on the verge of the playoffs. Uh, of course, 
the team that, that beat him this past week, Clay Hendricks of Furman. Nobody expected Furman to be in the top five. He's done an awesome job. And then John Troxel at Lafayette, mm-hmm. five and one, five and zero oh against the FCS, just beat Holy Cross inside track to that Patriot League bid. Uh, John Troxel in his second year at the helm of the Leopards. But then you go to somebody who's just doing the job they're supposed to do, and that's Jimmy Rogers, taking over for a legend, and that team hasn't missed a beat. So his name should be considered. Yes, I know you'll get the, well, South Dakota State's got the best team and they've got the most talent and they just won and they should win again. Yeah. And he hasn't missed a beat. He's got the team doing exactly what they're supposed to do. He should be considered. So those are my four names that I throw out. I know you'll get your your Eck and your Vegan and let's see who else. You can throw names out of uh, Ryan Cardi, Delaware. Um, There's a lot of names you can throw out. Cody Hawkins is, I mean, he has elevated an Idaho State team that everybody thought would be in the cellar, and they have gotten a couple of wins you wouldn't expect. So, yeah, that's what this sport is all about. But, yeah, those first three or four names are probably at the top of my list. Uh, be interested to see when balloting comes out who's on there because usually it's only one per conference. So is it going to be Clay Hendricks or is it going to be Kerwin Bell? Just like last year, I wanted it to be Jason Eck. He didn't even make the list. And I would have voted for him. So the, the list that comes out also matters. So uh, long and short answer, those are some of the names I'm really looking at. Yeah, my, my two are going to be, um, you know, Bell and then uh, John Troxel. So you, you got it down to a science. I don't see how you wouldn't nominate two of those dudes. So, yeah, they're outperforming what they used to be. The coolest thing about, like, Kerwin Bell is they took over a Western Carolina team who was a dumpster fire. They were like a two-win program. And this is kind of what the last head coach is. Why, why is it drawing a blank from Montana state did not now they weren't a dumpster fire like Western Carolina, but choke, choke, choke. But every year they were building something better. So like his first year, cause what, this is only his third or fourth year running Western Carolina. They were like a four win program. They went four and seven, but that was still a big upgrade from their two and nine season. Then all of a sudden they went what six and five. And now they're, looking like a for sure playoff team as long as you know they don't crap out at the end of the season so when you're building a team just a little bit better every single year that's where you're going to sustain success in my opinion over some of the teams that like they were dumpster fire they jump up and they shoot up right away and then once that head coach leaves you're done it seems like he's building up this team for the future um and you know lafayette's head coach john he's kind of doing the same thing now they weren't in the same situation as western carolina but uh you know they weren't a contender. No one thought they were going to be running the Patriot League this year. And after this win against Holy Cross, you're like, who are they losing to? Maybe Fordham because Fordham's not bad, but that's like their only last tough game on the schedule. Uh, They have a chance to run it and be undefeated in the FCS, which is pretty cool. The, uh, that is going to be a very difficult, difficult vote. I mean, you just, you got your top three or four there, Jamie, but man, you, you almost got down seven or eight deep where any of those guys should be considered. So Best of luck. Just real quickly, Jamie, out of curiosity for anybody out there, are you voting for these Coach of the Year candidates in <laughs> in the uh, regular season finale, or is this during the playoffs? When will your vote have to be in? What has occurred up to the vote? The Yeah, the vote is through the end of the regular season. So our ballots will most likely be due the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, would be my guess, right before that first round starts. So yeah, nothing that happens in the playoffs will be able to influence anything as far as any of the awards. Walter Payton, Buck Buchanan, Coach of the Year, uh, Eddie Robinson, or the Jerry Rice. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a regular season award. It's a, on regular season accolades, and I'm gonna because I'm I'm not gonna get out of here without mentioning my guy once so the trajectory that uh, Kyler just mentioned for uh, Western Carolina. I expect Southern Utah to have that same trajectory next year. Can I ask Jamie a quick question? Sure. Mm-hmm. Out of the top five coaches um, in all the FCS, why is Aaron Best one of them, and why do you rank him top two? Um, you know, because he recruited great players like Eric Berrier and Hell yeah. all these wonderful award winners. Uh, My man. He knows how to spot talent. Um, Aaron, Hell yeah. Aaron Best is definitely the best at probably Fuck getting yeah. fired this year. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. That, that took an interesting turn. All right, yeah. my bad. 
Big, uh, that was a Kermit the Frog uh, tea drink, too. I did notice that meme. It was beautiful. Uh, guys, Chase Beckvar says, never really followed National FCS before. Well, Chase, welcome to the show because you're on it. Uh, what are the odds or chances of UCA getting a seed? And Matt Bernhardt threw in a question. This week got me thinking, is there a scenario where the Jacks take in Missouri Valley Conference loss while the Cats go undefeated in Big Sky? That the Cats pass the Jacks even with the head-to-head -head loss? I'm guessing a no, but just wondering what you guys think. So um, I guess we're curious about seeding. Jamie, do you see that um, UCA team getting an opportunity to be a seed? And where do you see the seeds kind of starting to line up? Because that is where it's going to get pretty – the chaos actually truly comes in hand-to-hand -hand if you start looking at these seeds, especially if SDSU or Montana State drops one or two. How do you see yeah. that stuff start to play out? So Central Arkansas – They've got four games left. They got Tarleton at home, and then they go to North Alabama. I think they easily win those. They get Eastern Kentucky at home, a very up and down team. We'll see which team shows up, and then they go to Austin P. If they run the table there, let's see Central Arkansas. Where are they here? All right, we'll say they run the table, and Austin P is still ranked. That would be their only ranked win. They'll be eight nine eight and two. I believe uh, if at that point, nine and two at that point, if they run the table, I and with a ranked loss and only one ranked win. They also did play a non-division one team, which the, the committee says doesn't count, but I think it only counts for Montana. So I think they will be in the discussion for the seven and eight. I don't know if there'll be enough juice there for them to get a seed, but they could be in the discussion. I, I just think one ranked win. It is not going to be enough to get, um, at nine and two. I think they're going to be um, probably hosting a first round game. It for sure is going to be dependent on what happens with everybody else, which is a cop out answer. But let's just say SDSU runs the table. So they're the one. Montana State, uh, Matt, I don't think any of us are going to say that Montana State has a chance to jump SDSU, even if SDSU has a Missouri Valley Conference loss. Um, just because of that head to head, I still think they'd probably go one to SDSU. But being top twenty, being top one or two, sometimes being the two seed is better based off all the field falls. But that being said, if SDSU and Montana State are one and two, let's say Furman runs the table and they're number three, things get pretty open there. Like I think UCA could have a shot at a seed. I mean, Mont Idaho is going to have two losses, one of them FBS. Montana in that scenario is going to be down to two losses. Western Carolina, they're at their two losses. We'll see what happens with Delaware. But they're definitely going to have at least a huge argument when we do our mock playoff special if we get to that point. In three Tyler, weeks? Yeah, in three weeks. Make sure you join us for that. That's what, that's my favorite episode of the year. What do you think, Kyler? Would UCA have a shot in this scenario? I'm never going to say no, but um, I don't think so, right? Uh, the committee is going to look at everything. Right now, the UAC, they have a whole bunch of teams that are probably in between a 22 in the nation to 40. And not a lot of teams outside of that. So um, they're still going to lean on that. UAC was not even remotely competitive versus North Dakota State. The score was made them look even better than what really happened in that game. And then they didn't play any other top 20 teams since. So, again, it, it's one of those things where I'm like, I, I just don't see it. Um, and I, I, I'm probably going to have UCA, even if they win out, I don't see how I can put them above my top 15 just because, again, the only top 15 team they played right now, and, and even North Dakota State may not be looking like a top 15 team. They're right on that verge. Made them look not even competitive, and they haven't played anyone remotely good enough since. I get it. The UAC is fun conference. There's a lot of potential in that conference, but they're still three years away from being a good conference, in my opinion. They're, they're a strong conference where everyone is about the same, but they even lack like the top tier teams from the SoCon, in my opinion, that that when the SoCon was so evenly battled, I don't I don't see it. Um, so it's going to be tough. I'm not saying it's far fetched because if they went out, I mean, there's always going to be an argument for it. And we'll see who who loses that were going to be a potential seed. I mean, if Incarnate Word wins out, they're probably going to get a seed, even though I don't think they're seed worthy right now. Um, they haven't played remotely like a top 10 team. So it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't know. The committee, they look at resume. 
what's UCA's best win? Maybe the 29th best team in the nation, right? I mean, at the end of the day, Eastern Kentucky just lost to Gardner Webb. Who's good in the UAC that's a top 25 worthy team? It only looks like it's Central Arkansas and no one else. But there's a lot of strong 35 ranked teams. It's a balanced conference. So it's going to be tough. Um, I just I don't see it, but it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. We'll see what happens. You can only play who's in front of you, but you can also be impacted a lot by who is who is on your schedule. So, And if you got blown out by someone who's on your schedule. Yes, very true. Craig Haley, uh, the one of the media goats of the FCS. I got his tweet pulled up here. The FCS Playoff Selection Committee will announce its current top 10 rankings at 2 p.m. Eastern Thursday on ESPN2 College Football Live Show. So if you want to see what the committee may be thinking, this Thursday it's coming up here. And the 2014 field will be released on November 19th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, ESPNU. Make sure you join us here at the FCS Fans Nation Podcast. We're going to be live streaming the revealed playoffs. And uh, the week before, we will do our mock playoff special episode. Should be a lot of fun. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the episode. But it's been a fun episode. And unlike last week, we're actually going to eat this time, guys. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And if you're right, put some tacos in there, too. This is Thompson's Taco Bets. All right, guys. I hated last week's taco bet. I love this week's one. Should be interesting to see what you think. So this one's kind of set up a little bit with my own thinking, realizing that Montana State bumped up to number two when North Dakota State lost to South Dakota. And really now it's just the top two teams in the FCS, right? You got South Dakota State. You got Montana State. Who has been number three in the polls all season? Montana State has been number three in the polls. Idaho, Sacramento State, who just lost, and undoubtedly Furman's about to be there. Okay, so that will be four different teams have taken the number three spot in the stats top 25 poll. So with four weeks remaining, not five like I have here on YouTube, over or under one and a half teams get ranked number three this season. What do you think? Uh, Jamie, do you see more than one team taking that spot? Or is Furman just going to hold Pat and, and run the table? With the way Chase Artopias, or however you say that, is playing for Chattanooga, that is going to be a tough game for Furman to go to Chattanooga and play. And it's the SoCon. So I'm going to say Chattanooga is going to win that game. So I'm going to go over that. It will be Ooh. Furman and then somebody else, uh, likely likely Delaware, because South Dakota is going to play South Dakota State in the meantime. Ah, okay. All right. I'm, I'll go with the the under. I, 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 got more, I got faith in Furman, and I think it's going to keep him right where they're at. So I'm going to go under. I'm going to go with Furman to, to maintain. Kyler, what do you think? Over, under, we get at least two more teams that hit. Uh, this is beyond Furman this week. Furman's already predicted to be in. Will we see two more teams hit that top? Three? Oh, wait, wait. Furman doesn't count in it? Yeah, Furman. Well, no, yeah. Furman's not number three yet. Oh, that's true, I guess. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Furman. Do- okay. So really, so if, Furman doesn't, if Furman doesn't count, I'm going under. I know. Furman, 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 Furman counts. Because counts, they're, okay, they're not there yet. They're not there yet. But we, we know what's going to happen. So Furman does count. You're really banking off one more team pulling it off. So what do you I, think, Kyler? I don't think Furman's going to lose. But maybe Montana State can lose. I know I just said they're by far the best team in the Big Sky, and they 100% are. That's the thing. If they played every Big Sky team 100 times, they would probably win against each team 75-plus times. The only difference is all it takes is one. This is by far their toughest five road game stretch that they've had all year. Most of them were on the road, too. Um, you typically lose one in the big sky. I'm mm-hmm. going to say we're going to get the over, but not because Furman loses like Jamie said, but because another team loses, which jumps up another team. Dang, okay. So coming at it from a little bit of a different angle. I like that. And that's right. a bad bet. Do not bet on Montana State to lose. From everything I've seen from them, they should not lose to any team left on their schedule. They just think there's going to be something weird that happens. And there's well, no logical reason for it. There may be no logical reason, but one second you think things are going just completely normal, and then very quickly things can change. 
Just because your question is answered quickly doesn't mean we don't care. These are the quick hit questions of the week. Gentlemen, let's start with Mr. Joshua Hoffman right here. And he wants to know for our quick hits, what is a weird food that many don't like that you do? For example, he loves sauerkraut. Dude, I'm going to commit blasphemy right here, Joshua. As like a heavy Norwegian area up here. I think my family's got Norwegian in them. I hate sauerkraut. Hate it. Can't stand it. So that doesn't answer your question. I'm just telling you, if you invite me over for sauerkraut, Joshua, or if you have it at the tailgate, I am not eating it. Not a chance. <laughs> Tyler, uh, do you have a food, weird food that many don't like that you actually love? Yeah, um, and maybe you guys won't even know what this is, but kipper snacks. You guys know what I that is? Never heard of kipper snaps. That sounds like a dog treat. Yeah, right? Um, they are kind of like, they're in a can, right? You can get them at a store, but it's kind of like an anchovy, but it's a full fish in a can. It's really salted. But, you know, when you're from the Pacific Northwest, you do like seafood probably more than most people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just this can full little tiny fish, a kipper snack. It's delicious. Kipper snack. Okay. Well, if you can get kipper snaps down to Frisco, I would love to try them. Canned fish, baby. Yeah, it's, it's basically a sardine, right? Okay. Jamie, what do you love that people really don't? I I like just about most anything. I don't know. I, I'm picky about certain things, too, so I'm, I'm on each edge of the uh, spectrum there. But I think the only thing I, that popped into my head was calamari. I don't a lot of people so like good. calamari. I like it. Who doesn't like calamari? I don't know. A lot of people. Freaking Virginia, man. I don't think I've ever met one that doesn't. Calamari is so good. Calamari is definitely up there. I'd eat it for I, breakfast. Mm. Josh, this yeah, is okay. Then, then I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I like a lot of foods, but I also don't like a lot of foods. Like, I'm not eating okra or pickled pig's feet or, you know, souse or anything like that. So, I mean, I bet you Kevin likes some souse, but <laughs> pig's feet's not that bad if it's prepared right. It's not that bad. All depends what you're chomping on, you know? Uh, chicken, how about chicken gizzard? Fried chicken gizzard. Oh, those are so good. Chicken Damn heart's it. good too. Chicken heart is amazing. Mm. Oh, uh, too Jamie. good. I like meats. Hey, get the meat sweats around here. We get those down in Frisco when we go and get some uh, brisket. Uh, great question, Joshua. Uh, Jason Blocking comes back at us, guys. Colby Carthel is three and five this year at SFA and 26 and 27 over his five years. He does have a single playoff appearance to his credit, but has fallen short of expectations yet again. What is his trajectory in SFA? What do you think, Kyler? We got a little bit of a hot seat situation here down in SFA or no? I mean, no. Um, I mean, if you're an SFA fan, what, what's what been your highlight since you've been a fan? Uh, I think he's fine. He's doing about what SFA should be doing. Um, I think they'd be Duke at basketball. Yeah, it's a basketball school at the end of the day. SFA is a solid basketball school. I, I, a lot of the players like him. I think he can bring in a lot of talent to SFA. But I mean, look at the last 20 years. You haven't done much, so the expectations are kind of there. I think he's fine for a while. I don't, I don't think that program's much of a, if you don't get to the playoffs every single year, you're fired type of a program. Sorry, Helton. It's just, it is what it is. Eastern's going to turn into you guys real soon, too. <laughs> Trust the process a little bit. Should we be surprised by some of the favorite teams that have fallen? Jamie Williams, Holy Cross, NDSU, William & Mary? Or was the writing on the wall and everyone ignored flaws because of past success? What do you think? No, I, I think it goes right back to what Kyler said uh, about the portal and how quickly teams can change from one year to the other, good and bad. And it, it's just what we see in FCS football. A team will, will pop one year and then they fall back the next. And that's just kind of where we are with some of those teams. I mean, William and Mary didn't lose a ton. They lost a couple of offensive of linemen. And then Bronson Yoder went down with an injury, but everything else is the same. I mean, they lost their defensive coordinator, but the defense has still been good. So it's sometimes you just can't explain it. It's just results one year don't translate to the one the next year. And, you know, sometimes you win all your one score games, sometimes you lose all your one score games. And that's all that chalk it up to. I mean, it's just, it's football. It's football. Very well said. Jack Schmidt says, does it make sense for FCS teams to try scheduling bottom of the barrel FBS teams and get that win given how much value is placed on FBS wins and polls and the relative lack of downside in a loss? Well said here, my man. Um, yeah, I think that's super smart. I think if you can pull that kind of scheduling off, that's genius. 
Uh, I know North Dakota State and some of the others have tried to make calls to the more G5 schools and the scheduling just never seems to work. Uh, but if you can go play somebody who's draft, like Northern Illinois or uh, go play some Mac school that's awful and go beat the crap out of them and look better in the polls, that's definitely better for your team. So um, your fans would probably prefer to go to like Eugene, Oregon or somewhere else, but it looks good. And you're right. There's no negative if you lose. So Seth Meyer says, true or false, Mercer doesn't make the playoffs without a win over Western Carolina next week. Ooh, Jamie, you got the head nod. Is is that true? That's absolutely true. I mean, Mercer must win out to make the playoffs. They are not going to get in as a 7-4 and four team. They've got to be 8-3. and three. they got to win out. they got to win all four. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that could wind up as a play-in game. I don't know, just because of the way the SOCON gets treated by the uh, – by the committee but yeah they're going to be on the bubble again i'm rooting for mercer to make the playoffs but they still haven't beaten those top tier teams they're still that middle like i've been saying uh, people argue with me all preseason long and i you know i like mercer i wanted to see them there but they still haven't done it yet and they still gonna have to beat sanford too we'll see if they can get it done starting this weekend um the rev wants to know kyler rev it up are you and NDSU still top 20 teams? Are these still top 20 teams of the FCS, buddy? Not even close. They're not even top 150. Um, yeah, of course, they're still top 20 teams. I mean, I held just doing it for clicks, and I appreciate it. And that's what we should even put on the podcast tag. Are you and NDSU even top 20 teams? That's going to get some clicks. So thank you, Dustin, for that idea. But yeah, they, they definitely still are. Yeah, the... The, the Dakotas are fine. The Dakotas are doing okay. Uh, Preston Adams says, shout out to NCC, NCCU for beating Morgan State while ranked. Uh, a game we saw NCA and T falter on in more than one occasion. Um, that game was way closer than it should have been. I could not believe that when it hit final. 16 to 10, serious? Uh, Davius Richard, he just threw for barely over 50%, 16 out of 30. 122 yards and one touchdown. Um that was it was kind of a defensive slobber knocker back and forth the offense didn't even click up until the fourth quarter going into the fourth quarter that was a three to three game and then you saw all the points in the fourth but hey good teams like the eagles like others sometimes you just got to find a way to win and that's exactly what they did it was pretty good uh which conference has the best defensive teams between the big sky and missouri valley conference kyler you can jump on the back of what i'm about to say mr jeremiah rash is asking about this one Jeremiah, by the way, we all, I think, mostly picked uh, South Dakota State to go over on the versus sports simulator. Good job to your SIU team. Couldn't come away with the victory, but they say good teams win, great teams cover the spread. So good job for you, buddy. Uh, between the defenses of the Valley and the Big Sky, Valley right now has five in the top 25 for total defense. Big Sky has two with Idaho at 14 and Montana State at 18. Outside the top 25, the next ranked total defense is you and I at 37. So I think the Valley is the answer, but Kyler, would you say styles definitely affect this? Or would you say no, that the Big Sky has actually transitioned more to a defensive style of the league? Or I mean, balance? It's transitioning, no. it's transitioning to a balance. I still think Missouri Valley overall has a little bit better defenses, but I also do think the Big Sky overall has probably more dynamic offenses, to be honest. So that's going to affect the stats anyway, but... No, for this question, I would still lean towards the Valley's the best defensive conference. Yeah, I think that's fair. And uh, on the Valley there, Kyler, Adam Peterson says, buy or sell the Illinois State offense. They had a big game, but unfortunately, they still lost. You didn't buy Illinois State earlier with a question a few weeks ago from Adam. Um, are you buying that their offense is clicking a little bit, or what do you think? Um, I think their offense is pretty decent. So I don't know if I'm buying or selling them holding. I'm holding and maybe uh, finding out, maybe I'm subleasing. I'm finding a renter who can take over space because uh, I don't want to buy or sell. I think they're decent. They're not good. They're not bad. They can they're do an a interesting lot of good things. Yeah, they're fun. They're a good, they're a solid team. I mean, they're definitely a solid team who's going to give some of the better teams maybe outside of South Dakota State a run for their money. Well said. But they can uh, do it on both sides of the ball too. I mean, yeah. they're just solid everywhere. They're not good. They're just solid. Yep, they just need consistency and growth. Be yeah. consistent and growth of what they have. Uh, last one here, William Oliver says, is Fireball a real whiskey or just <laughs> drunk packs of big red gum? <laughs> well said, William. One tweak here. It is uh, drunk packs of Red Hots. 
red hots is what it is. And if you don't know what red hots are, um, maybe you weren't growing up in the 90s, but those are those red hot candies that you put on top of like the Valentine's Valentine's Day cookies and stuff like that. Uh, Jamie, Kyle, you know what I'm talking about with Red Hots, right? Yeah, that's yeah. how you uh, that's how you snack Allison, right? You pick up some Red Hots with your Valentine, hundred percent brown one. Yeah, but it's an yep. atomic fireball. It's <laughs> that's what fireball is. It's the atomic fireball. The it has red. fireball in the name. Yeah, yeah. The little red things, right? Yeah, yeah. True, like little jawbreakers. True Frisco story about um, fireball is it's the 2014 Natty night before. And we're all at this bar and we're taking minnow shots. The bar is serving shots of fireball where they're taking little minnows and dropping the little little fish in there. And then people are taking shots and everybody around the table is going, gross. Oh, yuck. There's fish in that. That's disgusting. And I'm realizing as the fish are being dropped into the fireball, they're dying like right away. Like yeah. it's instant. And it just hit me in my mind. I'm like, people are grossed out about the fish, which probably has the smallest amount of protein, but they don't care about the poison in the glass that is instantly killing a creature as soon as it hits it. That's probably Dude. kipper snacks. Yeah, give me a kipper snack over a fireball shot any day of the week. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, uh, Too good. Well, uh, we appreciate the quick hit questions and the main questions this week. They absolutely were outstanding. Set up a great episode and it is time now, gentlemen, to do a little bit of predicting before we roll on out to another great week of FCS football. There is no way these guys can predict football games better than me. I am the Mighty Versus Sports Simulator. The Versus Sports Simulator is our sponsor for the podcast. They also bring us our game predictions every week where we're going to go over or under. And we are going to start, guys, with Kyler's Eastern Washington Eagles are taking on Portland State. We will do three games a week. And uh, this one is a fun one to pick because, dang, man, the, the Versus Sports Simulator has this as two, three, and four teams that are going to be about 1.5 points apart and total points 77. Holy moly. Kyler, it's your team. So, Jamie, what do you think? Eastern and Portland State, who gets the victory on a one-and-a-half point spread? I think I would make myself sick if I picked Portland State over Eastern Washington just based off of pure history. But, gosh, Portland State's offense is humming. I'm going to take Eastern. I'm just gonna I'm gonna take Eastern by like a field goal. A uh, shootout. No. We get one person per prediction here, but Kyler, it's your team. Go ahead. What do you think? Eastern gonna win this game? Well, Portland State does have our number one weakness, and that is a, a really solid dual threat quarterback who can run better than he can throw. So if you've seen anything about Eastern Washington's defense in the past, you know that is the worst case scenario. That being said, Portland State's defense still sucks. We're still clicking on offense. We got three quarterbacks. We're all about the same. Uh, Portland, yeah, Eastern's going to cover. Eastern going to cover one and a half. All right, the big matchup this week. Montana State is going to Idaho versus Sports Simulator. As this is the number three team versus number eight. Um, has a five and a half point favorite, essentially, going towards Montana State with total points at about 61 and a half. So what do you think there, Kyler? This is a big sky matchup. This is your region. Who's coming away with this man over or under? Montana State is by far the better team. Um, but Idaho is coming off a loss. They're coming off a bye. I have a, and it's at home, and I guess it's supposed to be pretty dang close to another sellout. So the Kibbe Dome gets cracked, and hopefully those fans can shut up when Idaho is actually on offense this time. I don't know. I have a <laughs> weird feeling that Eck is going to get this team fired up, especially after a bye week and after an embarrassing loss. Um, you should not follow this bet, but I'm going to go Idaho covers and actually Idaho gets the W. Do not Whoa. bet on that. That is a stupid bet. Don't do it, guys. Hey. Bet on Montana State. It's an easier bet. But I'm doing Idaho wins somehow because um, I want that Furman uh, number three seed bet. <laughs> you also want my Furman power. I did this last week where you guys went Western Carolina. You're just like, you know what? I'm taking them. That, this could be your moment, Kyler. It could be your moment there. Last one, guys. Uh, Northern Iowa going to Illinois State. Here you go, Adam Peterson. This one on the Versus Sports Simulator. It's a one and a half point spread. Northern Iowa going to Illinois State. Total points about 45 and a half. Um, I think you're going to go just under that 45 and a half for points. I'm going to go with a 24 to 21 game. So 
right, right under 45 and a half, 24, 21. And I'm going to give Illinois state that victory. They're going to this Northern Iowa team in their dome kills UND. It's time for their letdown and they're going to go to Illinois state and uh, Illinois state's going to come away with the win. So they're going to cover on their one and a half there by three points. And I will give the red birds a victory. So Adam Peterson, hopefully your week ends very well for you, my man. Uh, Jamie and Kyler, great predictions, great questions, which brings us to the end of the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Have to take a moment, though, before we roll out of here to really promote that we are four weeks away from FCS Selection Sunday. And we mentioned this earlier in the episode. Two, three weeks from now, three weeks from now, our episode will be the mock playoff special. That will be us predicting the last week's games that actually matter. And then Kyler, Jamie, and myself pretending to be the playoff committee. Do we do this live, gents? Do we traditionally do a live episode for this? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to be live for that one. And you guys can watch and follow along as we literally build the playoff bracket um, and kind of get in the mindset of, okay, what do people's resumes look like? How strong are the teams and what the field could look like come Selection Sunday for the seeds and who's in and who's out? On top of that, we will be live streaming when ESPN actually drops the teams. Uh, so you can join us as a Selection Sunday brunch and some mimosas in the morning. And it should be a really fun, entertaining time to see what the FCS playoff selection field is. As always, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, make sure you subscribe on YouTube for our podcast here. But before we roll out, I'd be reminisced if I didn't give Kyler an opportunity to just, you know, talk a little bit about how he's feeling as we roll into this next week in that beautiful new studio of his. Kyler, any last thoughts before we roll out here for the people? You should have given this to Jamie Williams. I got nothing, man. I'm just having a good time. We beat Weber State at homecoming, the 100th homecoming for Eastern Washington. And Weber State is, we haven't beat them since what, 2016 or 15, because Jay Hill's had Eastern's number. Mm -hmm. Jay Hill's gone, Weber State Weekly. Screw you. <laughs> Screw your t shirt company. You're, you're done. You're done forever. Um, no, love y'all. That's all I want to do. I want to troll Weber State Weekly. All Jay I want to say is, uh, from winding up in the ER on Wednesday to being able to watch some good football on Saturday, things have looked up for me. So uh, I don't know what the hell Matt's doing over there. It looks like some R2-D2 crap or something. But, yeah, yeah, things definitely looking up for me from the, where I was. In the <laughs> I think it's time to end this thing. I think, I think uh, it's absolutely time to land. God, this is so yeah. hack-like. We uh, There's the only – time we'll stop this podcast is when we stop having fun and i don't think we're anywhere close to that but thank you ladies and gentlemen for having fun with us and joining us on the fcs fans nation podcast we'll see you next week enjoy the matchups everybody boom thank you for listening to the fcs fans nation podcast make sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on your preferred listening platform whether it's apple spotify google or even youtube and make sure to follow our FCS Fans Nation social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening to the premier podcast for FCS football. Bo. Like, I probably won't get home till 10, till 8 your time. And I'm just going to skip the shower and do the podcast and then shower, I think. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. That's true dedication right there.